So thanks everybody for coming to our uh, St. Joseph University Zoom colloquium. This is our first one and um, uh, very excited to have Diana Davis here talking about um, billiards on regular polygons. So I'm hoping she can now take over the screen uh, and, and begin the lecture. Thank you so much for coming. All right. Yes, thank you very much for all of you for being here. Um, this is going to be a co-talk with Samuel Lelievre, my collaborator. Um, so you'll notice if you're wondering which of the people you can see, he's the one that's wearing the same shirt as me. So we'll be talking about periodic paths on the Pentagon. Um, please feel free to ask questions or say something at any point. I'd love to hear it. Uh, because I can't see almost any of you, I would ask that you precede your comment with some sort of verbal cue like, hey, so that I know to listen and then enunciate and speak loudly because I can't hear you. I can't see you. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to talk about periodic paths on the Pentagon and other shapes. So the goal is to understand periodic billiard trajectories on all the shapes, all the regular polygons with an odd number of sides. And the plan is that first we'll explain things for the square, where things are kind of simple, and then generalize to other shapes. So that's the plan. So here's billiards. A billiards is a ball bouncing around inside a shape, um, where the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, just like in real life. Um, everything is good. Can you see everything the right way? Everything's good? Okay. okay. So as humans, um, we understand periodic billiard paths on the square, um, the equilateral triangle, and the regular hexagon. Those are pretty easy because they tile the plane by reflection across their edges. So you can take a square, make a copy of it, make copies of it, and it tiles a whole plane, and that makes things pretty easy. And the same thing works for the uh, equilateral triangle, the regular hexagon, and a couple of other special triangles. And then Samuel and I have been working for a couple of years on understanding the regular pentagon. So I would say that we understand that one pretty well. And then just over the past couple of weeks, we've been working on other shapes. So as you can see at the bottom there, I put seven, nine, 11, and so on. And um, we have the tools now to, to learn about them, but we haven't totally understood them yet. So, so that's what the talk will be about. So we study periodic paths, meaning paths that come back to where they start. So here's hey, a couple Diana? of- Yeah. Uh, I can only see the first uh, slide of the talk so far. Have you really? moved to a- Yes, and someone yeah. else on the Same chat. Here. I'm also. still looking at the title. Fascinating. That's interesting. There we okay. go. Now it's yeah, well, now you're seeing yes. my, uh, okay. it's working good. now. Yeah, well, no, no. How about now? Yeah. Yes, yes. Good? good. You see yes. some bouncing? Super. Mm -hmm. Yes? The periodic pass in the square. Ready? And they're bouncing? And now you no, see no, something no. with some colors? No, no, no. The animation is not getting through. Oh, life is so hard. Life is so hard. This is probably you can't do the full screen thing you probably need to maximize the window and that's all you can oh this is not a problem okay fair enough okay well fine maybe i'll do like this how about that is that all right that works that works okay so um so you might wonder which directions are periodic like if i had a, a square shaped billiard table and i wanted to hit my path so that it bounces around and comes back which direction should I hit it? And so here's an idea on how to figure that out. You can unfold the table. So instead of that red ball hitting that yellow edge at the top, we unfold it and create a new copy of the table where the ball goes straight through. And then similarly, instead of the ball hitting the green edge on the side, we unfold and create a new copy of the table and so on. And so we keep going like this. And you might notice that the, this, the fourth square here at the top, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, yeah. um, great. The fourth square at the top is, uh, is, fits nicely right here at the bottom. So we'll put it in. And what we get is what's called a square torus. So it's a shape where we take the square and we glue the top to the bottom and we glue the left to the right. So let me show you what I mean by that. So um, here's the square torus. This is Mario Mirzakhani, uh, one of the greatest mathematicians of the 21st century, who unfortunately has died, but is back to help us understand the square torus. Wouldn't it be? So can you see her moving? Nope. 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 Uh, all right, well, anyway, we won't have any animations in this particular talk, but anyway, sh um, I'll tell you, um, if she disappears off the red here, she would reappear back down here. And if she 
disappears across the blue edge here, she'd reappear back over there. And so what I, so I would say this is a surface. And what I mean by that is we want to glue the top edge to the bottom edge. So we take the red and we bring them close together and then we stick them together, boom. And now we're also, the blue is supposed to be glued to the blue. So to make that easier, I'll stretch it out here and then I'll curve it around and then stick them together. And so that's what, how this square is actually a surface. We talk about it as a surface because uh, we can imagine gluing the edges together and it makes a surface. Um, and we call this a genus one surface, meaning that it has one hole. So this word genus means number of holes. You can see this has one hole. So you can think of it as a donut or a bagel. So here's what you can say. If you um, want to hit your billiard in such a way that it repeats, um, what you want to do on the square is hit it in a direction with a rational slope, meaning a slope that can be expressed as a fraction. So for example, if your favorite slope is three over five, like mine, um, that's, there's a picture of that right here. And um, you can tell, so slope, you might have learned is rise over run. So it rises three times and hits the top one, two, three times, and it runs five times. So it hits the side five times. And so the number of times it hits the sides is, well, three on the top, three on the side. And if you want to make this into a billiard trajectory, um, you, simply, you simply double it and turn everything into a bounce, which I think is very clever. And I invented that particular trick, FYI. So, um, so let's see. So if your uh, slope is P over Q in lowest terms, mean, meaning the fraction is reduced, then if you hit something with the slope of P over Q, then it will hit the sides 2p times plus 2q times. You can just count up for all the edges. So that's pretty exciting. What else? Um, so something that, so you might wonder what happens if your slope isn't rational? What if it can't be expressed as a fraction? Well, what happens is it just bounces around and eventually fills in the whole thing. So after a while, it would look like this. And if you can imagine, if you can believe it, um, a lot of the research in billiards is done in the irrational case, but I don't like it as much because it doesn't create such nice pictures. So I like the periodic case because it creates nice pictures. So, but this is what happens always. Uh, every trajectory is either periodic, like the ones that we'll be studying, or equidistributed, meaning that it fills in everything evenly. So I want to tell you about um, the tool that we'll be using. So, and I'm going to tell you about two ways that you might have seen it first, and then I'll tell you our third way. Question? Okay, so the Euclidean algorithm is for finding the greatest common divisor of two numbers. So you start with two numbers, let's say seven and five, and you wanna know their greatest common divisor. Well, the algorithm is, you repeatedly subtract the smaller one from the bigger one until they match. So for example, here we start with seven and five, five is smaller, subtract it. Now two and five, two is smaller, subtract it. Two is still smaller, subtract it. Now one is smaller, subtract it. Now we have the same numbers. So the GCD, the greatest common divisor of seven and five is one. Super. Here's another way of thinking about it, um, is as a continued fraction algorithm, it's the same kind of thing. Let's say you start with a rectangle and you repeatedly cut off the largest possible square. And when I say square, I mean square, like the sides are equal, not rectangle. So, and then you keep track of how many you cut off at each step. So continued fractions are really cool and they're not part of any standard curriculum as far as I know. So most people I think learn about them in talks. I know I did um, a talk when I was in college. And so if you haven't seen them before, this is your moment when you get to see them, <laughs> very cool. So here's continued fractions. Here's how I like to think about them. So suppose you have a number and you wanna know it's continued fraction expansion. Here's what you do. You start with a rectangle where one side, let's say the long side is your number and the other side is one and you cut off the largest possible square. So there's a the largest possible square. I could fit one of them. There's not room for any more. Then in the space that's left, I fit the largest possible square as many times as I can. And I was able to fit two of them. And then in the space that's left, you fit the largest possible square. Oh, and I was able to fit two of them. And so, I, and as I do that, I build a continued fraction on the side. Every time I switch the direction of the square, I do like a one over, because it's a sort of a, a flipping. And so that tells me if you can, you, can, you can reduce this with your pencil and figure out that it's seven over five. That's the, that's the aspect ratio of this rectangle. 
Um, and these are actually the same kind of thing. So in every case, so I'm gonna run these backwards. In the case of the GCD, I'll start with a GCD of one, so one and one. In the case of the squares, I'll start with a little square. And in case of the continued fractions, I'll start with a one. And then I'll just say, um, yeah, I'll add them together. Okay. And then I'll say, oh, that's enough. I think I'll flip now. So with the squares, we, we flip them. With the numbers, we switch to the other one. And with the continued fraction, we do a one over. And then you say, okay, let's add squares in the other direction. Boom. Mm, let's do it again. Boom. And then you say, okay, that's enough. So we switch everything. And then let's say add one in that direction. And so it's all the same, it's all the same thing. It's a Euclidean algorithm, it's a continued fraction algorithm, and it's this square thing. Cool, right? Great. I can't see any of you, but I assume that there is much applause. Um, so, so what's happening here is that at each step, we're in choosing to increase the x value or the y value. So like this red arrow is increasing the x value and this blue arrow, arrow is increasing the y value. And so at every moment, you have two choices. So we can make a binary tree based on which choice you pick. Oops, yep, where's my binary tree? Yeah, so you can make a binary tree because you have two choices at each point. Okay, so here's our next way of thinking about this. So um, this is a, a movie showing what a shear is, um, but I'll tell you what it is because I can't show you. So you um, have an object and then you apply like a twit, like a, a shear means you fix some horizontal line and then above it, things go to the left and on the below it, things go to the right. Okay, so it just goes like that. Okay, so um, we have these shears. So let's start with the first quadrant. So the first quadrant is where um, all the points have positive entries. We have a vertical shear, which takes the whole first quadrant just to the red part. And we have a horizontal shear, which takes the whole first quadrant just to the blue part. So the, the red one pushes up, the blue one pushes over. And if you've done linear algebra, those are the matrices that we use. We use the matrices with determinant one. So, so um, if you start with one zero and you apply both shears repeatedly, let's see what we get. Well, from one zero, we get um, one one. Oops. Then from one one, the red shear gives us uh, the point up and the blue shear gives us the point to the right. From there, we get some new points. From there, we get new points. From there, we get new points. And we can just keep doing this forever. And this process um, gives us every relatively prime lattice point. OK, what do I mean by that? So um, maybe you have been driving in your car, and you have passed an orchard. And you see the, the trees sort of go snap, 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 snap as you go past them. Um, and and that's because sometimes they're all lining up in a line and you see the tree in the front and you can't see the trees behind it. So what we get here is just the trees that you can see. So here we have Mariam here at the origin. So she can see the tree here at two comma one, but she can't see whatever's here at four comma two. So I haven't put a tree there. So those are, our, um, those are all the, the visible lattice points and those are our lowest terms periodic directions. Um, and I care about lowest terms because maybe you remember just a few minutes ago, I said if you, let's say you have a square billiard table and you hit your trajectory with a slope, if, if you have your slope in lowest terms, like three over five, then you can figure out how many times it bounces before it repeats. It's just two times three plus five. So you like, we like lowest terms or visible points. That's what we like. Okay, it also puts a tree structure on all the points, and this is exactly the binary tree structure that I was talking about before. So for every point, like this one here, you have one thing coming in and then you have two choices going out. Should I do the red shear or the blue shear? Should I increase the y or increase the x? So that's our beautiful thing. Um, and it also gives every point a tree location. So like this yellow point here, it said we did the red shear one and then blue and then red and then red and then blue to get there. And so we'll use those often. Um, well, these, this is, this we'll call our tree word. So this is sort of like a zip code that tells you where you are. It doesn't always have five digits, but this one does. Okay, so here's the tree structure. These are all of our lowest terms periodic directions. And this is our binary tree that we get from making a choice at every, at every, at every moment. 
So let's see. So this is in some examples of billiards on the square, and I'm just going to push them to the side for you. So, all right. So, so if you have slope five over three, we saw that one before. Then here's one with slope seven over five. Here's slope one over 15 and slope 15 over one. Those have certain similarities. So you can look at these and you can say, oh yes, that one is beautiful. And you can decide which one you like the best. But you might notice that they're all kind of similar. They all kind of look like a chain link fence. They're made of diamonds and triangles. And so, so maybe there isn't so much interesting going on in the square. And so we should try a different shape. So the takeaway message of this part is that for billiard trajectories, the direction or the slope determines what happens. And also that on the square, everything kind of looks the same. They're like basically a bunch of diamonds. So we should move on to the Pentagon and friends. All right, let's do that. So with our square, we, we had a billiard trajectory and we unfolded the square to get new copies and that gave us our square torus surface. We're gonna do the same thing with our pentagon. So here's a pentagon billiard table. You can imagine you have a ball bouncing around in here, boo, 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 and it is so complicated. So instead we want to unfold it. So we unfold this, oops, that's not how we do it. We unfold it and here's the goal. We wanna find parallel edges that we can glue together just like in our torus, in our square. But they have to be parallel and they have to have the same color because they have to have come from the same original edge. So maybe you can see that in this picture, there are no parallel edges with the same color. So sad. So we have to keep going. Oh, nope. Nope. So sad. Keep going. Hey! Okay, so here, these two edges are parallel and they're the same color. They came from the same original edge. So we'll glue them. So if you were walking along, you were a small bug and you went to here, you would end up over here. Do, 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 like that. Okay, let's keep going. We have some new friends to, to glue together. There's all these colored parallel buddies. And if you keep going on, everything ends up with an oppositely oriented parallel, same color edge, and we get this big surface. Okay, so this surface um, is genus six, meaning it's like, it's like a bagel with six holes. It's kind of complicated. And so what we're going to do is simplify our lives. So what we did was we started with a Pentagon billiard table and we unfolded to this big surface with six holes and five vertices. And but what we can do is we can simplify our lives by projecting down to just the double pentagon. So you might notice that in this big um, surface, which we call the necklace, there are five right side up pentagons and five upside down pentagons. And what you can decide whichever one is upside down that you want. Um, anyway, so we just project all the right side up pentagons onto this one here and all the upside down ones onto this one here. And so we can do most of our work on the double pentagon. So life is good. Um, why would we want to use the double pentagon? Well, I studied it from my PhD thesis. So I had already done like four years of thinking about the double pentagon um, before we started this project. So it's a good choice. So what is the double pentagon? Well, it's a surface where um, there's these five pairs of edges that are identified. And so you can see here Libby is, is dancing there on the surface and she's about to walk across the yellow edge. You can see her hand coming out of it. And if, if we had an animation, you could see her walking right onto that other edge. And so, um, so it's a surface where anytime you walk across an edge of one color, you reappear on the edge of the same color. So kind of like if you have read Harry Potter, kind of like the train platform where you just go into the wall and you end up somewhere else, except in this case, you just end up on the other polygon. It's a wonderful surface. And it has a friend. It's good to be a surface with a friend. It has a friend called the golden owl surface. So this is the same exact thing, except a bit of different shape. So if you, so, um, so the green edge is identified to the other green edge and so on. And what this is, is it's two overlapping golden rectangles. So the golden rectangle, the, the, um, the golden ratio is this number, which we, called, which we call phi. It's, and uh, we have a re rectangle in ratio phi and we overlap it with another one. And the magic thing is that the little, the little one that we get when we cut off a square is in the same uh, proportions as the original. So that's the thing that is special about the golden rectangle and people love them. So 
Um, so the golden rectangle is thought to be the, the aspect ratio that people like the most. So for example, if you have um, uh, a driver's license, you may find that it is in the golden ratio. If you have money, you may find that it is in the golden ratio. Um, and money things are very close to the golden ratio because people think they're beautiful. And we think they're beautiful too. Okay, so that's why we use it. Um, how are they, why, do, why, why is this coming up in this talk? Well, it turns out that the double pentagon surface and the golden L are the same. So this is the mind bending part of the talk where you have to take the picture on the left and shear it in your mind up until that those parallelograms become rectangles and then you get the picture on the right. Yeah, do you see it? Or you can take the picture on the right and shear it to the right until those pentagons become regular pentagons. So we'd like to understand what happens on the double pentagon surface, but angle 72 degrees is complicated. So we wanna use the uh, golden rectangle. Okay, why is the golden rate? Okay, and you might say, uh, oh, but Diana, it's these, these bits sticking out, but this edge is identified to this edge, so we simply take this triangle, put it over here, take this one, put it up here, and then we get the same surface. And you might wonder, why is the golden ratio coming up? Well, in a regular pentagon, the length of the diagonal, the ratio of the length of the diagonal to the side is the golden ratio. So that's how it comes up. Okay. And the other reason we wanted to use it was because, well, I told you that I'm a double pentagon expert. I studied it for my PhD thesis. Um, and Samuel is a golden L expert. So before we met, Samuel had, put, had, had written at least one paper, maybe more, more papers on the golden L. He was a golden L expert. And so um, it worked well for us to work together on this subject because we have different expertise. This is a key tool in math that people use. People with different expertise come together and study the same thing and bring their different uh, skills to bear on this same problem. So, so what should we do? Okay, so we mentioned that on the square, if you wanna hit your billiard ball in such a way that it bounces around and then repeats, you wanna hit it in a direction that has a rational slope. And another way to talk about a rational slope is that it's a direction that connects lattice points in the square grid. So for example, this one is like, it goes over seven and up two. So it's slope two sevenths, it's a lattice vector. Um, and we can generalize this notion to the golden L if we want to have a periodic direction on the golden L, we just um, unfold a bunch of golden Ls until we have a vector going from corner to corner. So that is what we want. So those are our periodic directions here. And it turns out those are just um, rational multiples of the square root of five. Or rational multiples of the golden ratio, whichever one you like, they're the same. So those are our periodic directions. Okay, so before I had these two shears for the first quadrant that took the whole first quadrant to the top, which was red, and the whole first quadrant to the bottom, which was blue. And you can think of that as being like putting a little square in the corner and then using the square to break the first quadrant into two pieces. Here, I'm gonna use a golden L to break the first quadrant into pieces. And so it breaks the first quadrant into four sectors. And here we have, here are matrices that take the first quadrant to each of these sectors. So the red one is again a shear, it's a vertical shear. The blue one is again a shear, a horizontal shear. And the yellow ones are um, hyperbolic. They, 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 take things, they, they take things far away. And they all also have determinant one, which means that they preserve area. All right, so what should we do with them? So if we wanna get all of the periodic directions on the golden L, which is our pentagon, basically, um, we start at one zero. And just like before, we apply all of our transformations. So the blue transformation doesn't do anything, but the other ones get us new points. Then from each of these points, we apply our four transformations. One, two, three, gives us a lot of new points. From each of those, we apply new transformations. And you can see, we just get lots and lots of periodic directions, most of which are off of the screen. Okay, so here's a tree. Last time we had a binary tree, and now we have, well, a quaternary tree, meaning everything has four children. So starting at the top, 
if we apply each of the four transformations, we get these four new things. And then from each of those, we apply the four transformations and get the four new things. Well, that's a cool picture if you like vectors and you like the symbol phi, um, but it's nicer in pictures. So this is like a family tree of, of billiard trajectories on the regular pentagon. So the simplest one is this one that's parallel to a side. It just gives you a little pent another little pentagon inside. Um, first generation, so this is like the, the ancestor. And then the first generation are these three, so nice. And then each of those has four children. And then you can imagine each of those has many children as well. So um, one thing that we noticed is that the tree is symmetric, meaning that the one on the left is the same as the one on the right, the one here is the same as the one there, and so on, which is kind of nice. We were able to prove that, and it's because the first quadrant is symmetric. If you flip it, it's the same. OK, so uh, we were also able to prove a theorem. So I. Um, was sort of obsessed with this question for quite a while. The question was, um, if, you, if you hit a ball in a given periodic direction in the Pentagon, what's the period? And we were able to solve this. So if you, if you start with the point one zero and you apply a bunch of these transformations, you get some point of the form a plus b times phi, c plus d times phi. And we were able to prove that the period, the number of bounces on the double pentagon is two times a plus b plus c plus d, which is basically the most beautiful answer you could have gotten. Because for the, um, for the slope on a square, if your slope is p over q, the number of bounces is two times p plus q, which just double the coefficients, double the entries. And here, it's also double the entries. So it's like the most beautiful um, possible answer that it could have been. So that was extremely pleasing. And wonderful. OK, so we were very happy with this wonderful answer. And also, we wrote a program to show billiard trajectories. So I just, before, I showed you some billiard trajectories on the square. And now I'll show you some on the pentagon. So there are the two basic ones that are parallel to a side, the star and the pentagon. Then we get this nice one that I call the rocket ship. Then we get this one called the tunnel. Then we get the one that is being called the Frank Morgan trajectory. Yep, that got him accused of being a Satan worshiper. Sorry about that. Um, this is a very popular trajectory. This one, this one I like a lot, especially at small scales. Nobody likes this one, but I just wanted to show you that you can get some things that aren't so beautiful. This one I like to call the pentagram. Also this one kind of looks like a pentagram. This one also looks like a Tunnel. This one I thought would make great earring. Look, it has that wonderful hole there all ready for a little earring hole thing. This is also a winner. Okay, so what you should take away from this is that, again, the direction determines the path. And so the sequence of transformations that we apply determines the kind of picture that you get. Um, and also on the Pentagon, things look really different. So on the square, everything kind of looked like a chain link fence. Um, but on the Pentagon, we get all these different pictures, which are kind of beautiful. I hope you agree. So I just, I'll just talk about a few um, things that happen on other polygons that don't happen on the square. So these are like things that people didn't realize happened with billiards until we started studying them. So yay, yay us. So trajectories have different symmetries. Some of them have only reflection symmetry, like this one on the left, and some of them have reflection and rotation symmetry. So like this one on the right. So how does reflection symmetry arise? Well, from sort of folding it up fully. So for example, here's a trajectory of period four on the double pentagon, meaning that it takes four pentagons before it gets back to where it started. So this edge over here is parallel to this edge over here. And so when it gets to here, it's back where it started. And if we fold this up, it's a full billiard trajectory. And so, so that's a full billiard trajectory. And so the period on the double pentagon is four, and so is the billiard period. This looks like it only bounces two times, but you can see it actually bounces four times. One, two, three, four. And it bounces perpendicularly. On the other hand, this one, this is a, another periodic billiard trajectory because this edge is parallel to that edge. This distance is the same. When we fold it up, 
it isn't back to where we started. That's not a billiard, that's not a closed billiard trajectory. So we have to do it five times. And so five times the double pentagon period gives us the billiard period in this case. So here's one, another one that folds up and isn't complete. So we have to do it five times. And here's one that folds up and is complete. So that's kind of surprising one. Looks, I don't know, like a bunny or something. And very nice. So um, to revise our theorem, to fully achieve my goal of many years, um, the Pentagon billiard period is double the vector coefficients if the trajectory has only reflection symmetry, and then you have to multiply that by five if it has rotation symmetry also. And we can figure out when we have one symmetry or the other using the group. Okay, so here's some paths with only reflective symmetry. This one is kind of cool. You can see that it bounces here perpendicularly. I'll just show you a few. This is a regular 15 gun, which I was exploring because it was my niece's 15th birthday, and I wanted to find her some cool picks, which I did. Pretty cool, right? Look at that. Nobody's ever seen those before. All kinds of things can happen, but these only have reflection symmetry. How, and then how about buddies? This is something that doesn't happen on square either. It's always good to have a buddy. So buddies, oh, this will be so sad. Uh, uh, I have such a beautiful animation here. Okay, so buddies are the parallel trajectories in any dimension. Oh, actually, maybe I can make it go. Go. Yeah, can you see that? Yes, great. Okay, so the idea here is th that um, you have decided that you are going to hit your ball in this direction, but you have not yet decided where you are going to stand. And so this animation shows, suppose you're hitting it in this direction, but you were, you're standing at different places. So here we go. We'll see what happens. Oh, nope, try again. So as you can see, when it hits the corner, it switches to a different trajectory, but it stays parallel. So there's these two that I call buddies because they're parallel and you can see they're very similar. And you can probably tell that the blue one is longer. It's longer by a factor of the golden ratio. So the golden ratio comes up a lot. And there's sort of, we go all the way around and then come back to where we started. Isn't it so beautiful? It's so beautiful. Yay. All right. So the reason is because there are these two cylinders. What's happening is like, this is the simplest trajectory. If we have a trajectory like this on the double pentagon, well, you can shift it a little to the right, all good, all good, all good. But then when you hit the corner, it goes into the blue region and then it becomes this trajectory. So there's sort of two different things that can happen on the pentagon. And on the, uh, the higher, the ones with a higher number of sides, there's more of these, what's called cylinders, these colored strips where different um, behaviors happen. So here's some examples. Here's some horizontal buddies on, on the regular pentagon. These are the two that we have seen. Here's some horizontal buddies on the 15 gun. So what I did here was I, I shot a horizontal trajectory starting at the midpoint of an edge, and then I just moved down to the next edge and down to the next edge and so on. So I, as you can see, maybe as I go across this picture, the horizontal trajectory that I'm doing is going down and down and down. And so you can see that you get sort of different things. Um, and in fact, you can see that we have different symmetries. So here we have symmetries of order three, five, and 15. Those are the divisors of 15. Um, here we didn't, one is also a divisor of 15, which we could have gotten, but we didn't in this case. How about the 27 gun? I picked 27 because it has, because it's like three times three times three. So you can see these all, these are all, like, we decided to stand here and hit our, ball in this direction, but as we change where we're standing, we get different pictures. So those are some different pictures that we get. And you can see they have lots of different symmetries, 1, 3, 9, and 27. Aren't those so beautiful? So beautiful. I assume you're all applauding wildly to yourselves. So the takeaway message is that the direction controls the behavior. Which direction you hit the trajectory in determines a lot. And but then in a given direction, there are several different buddies. So in this case of the 27 gone, there are 13 different buddies. It's roughly half, half minus one, half minus a half of the number of sides. So one last thing that I really like is families. So remember that we use these four shears to put a tree structure on periodic directions, one, two, three, and four. And we got this tree. 
And um, here it is in pictures. So as you might imagine, I really like mathematical outreach and, and showing how beautiful math is to people. And so I thought it would be nice to make a poster of like a, a Pentagon family tree. Who wouldn't love that? But as you, as you can see, like my screen is almost all filled up already. And each of these ones that exists here has four children. So at the next level, you'd have lots of like 48 things and it would get filled up very quickly. But if you want, we can zoom in, for example, we can zoom in on this one and look at its children, just its four children. So this is a general principle, I guess, that even though this one is, is quite ugly, its children can be very beautiful. Good, okay, so, um, so, so you might've noticed that there are like countably infinitely many different trajectories. And I was thinking it would be nice to make Oh, you know, t-shirts or uh, jewelry or that sort of thing. But I didn't want to make uh, infinite inventory. So I made this website where I dumped the first 500 trajectories, simplest 500 trajectories, and I sent it to people. And I would say something like, hello, I will make you a pair of custom earrings. Please tell me which one you like the best. And they would, people would. And my goal was to just see what people liked the best. So I have a question for you. Look at this and decide which one is your favorite. Uh, they're the same in columns, so you just have to pick your, pick your favorite column. All right, I suppose you've picked a favorite. Think to yourself, did you pick this one? So um, I discovered that like roughly 40% of people pick this one. So when I would hold out this little cardboard box of things and I'd ask people to pick one, this is what they would pick so much of the time. And if I sent the link to the library to people, they would pick this, this one that I've highlighted in pink here as their favorite. Um, and then the one that was the favorite in the box is this blue one. And you can see that they're kind of related. And it's just like the um, level of resolution was was what gave yeah, people like this one better in high resolution people like this one better in in low resolution from, from wood so i was wondering what is the deal and because i had an entrepreneurial spirit um i wanted to make jewelry and i thought that they would make nice coordinate coordinating sets coordinating sets like you could have the simpler ones as the earrings and then the, the more complicated one as the necklace or then i noticed and there was this more complicated thing so i was wondering like what is the deal like where do I find these and, and why do people like them so much? And how can I find more? And in the middle of that, I went to Israel uh, to work with Brock Weiss at Tel Aviv University on a totally different thing. But um, he was interested in this library of trajectories and he had this idea. He said, what would happen if you twist it over and over? So I wanna tell you about that. So let's start with the trajectory on the double pentagon surface. So this is, this is a periodic trajectory. It goes to here, it ends up over here. It goes over to there, it goes over to there, and the double pentagon is a surface of genus two, so you can be thinking that it's like a donut with two holes. We give each one its own pentagon, and then to get a billiard trajectory, we fold, and in this case, it's not done yet, so we need five copies. Boom, to get back where we started. So that's how we turn surface trajectories into billiards. So here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna twist it. It's a horizontal twist, so I want you to be imagining this donut with two holes, but you imagine that you take, you take it and you, you like break open the, the donut and you give it a twist and you put it back together. So that's what you're doing over and over. So this is what's gonna happen. Ready, here we go. Twist, 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 twist. You can see how the trajectory, you can imagine if you had like um, a cinnamon swirl on your, don't, on your bagel and then you twisted it, it would get twisted up exactly like this, this red line in the picture. So it's getting twisted up. Twist it up, twist it up, there we go. We can twist it as much as we want. And now here's what happens when we fold those into billiard trajectories. Ready, here we go. Do you see it appearing? So it, you can see there's a star appearing. So what's going on? Well, this is exactly the phenomenon that was causing that beautiful family of things. So. So here's the beautiful family. Here's the one that people picked out of the box. Here's the one that people picked on the screen. And it's the same kind of thing. There's a twist going on. We're doing a twist and we're getting these beautiful paths. 
Ah, and yes, and so one of them is on my shirt and all the other people that are wearing the same shirt or the red version, all of you have uh, one member of this family on your shirt. Um, and so, so, so that was the state of the art until February. And then in March, I came over here for spring break to the Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques um, here in Pierre-sur-Rivette, France, which is where I am. I'm in France, as you check out my backyard. Um, and uh, we wanted to make this program, our program work for higher shapes, not just five. So we did. So um, this is a colloquium at St. Joseph's University, which was founded in 1851. And so this is an, an example of a periodic billiard trajectory on the regular 51 gone. So it, I know it kind of looks like a circle, but trust me, there's 51 inches there. And it turns out there are families on other shapes too. So we love families, let's see how they look. Pretty cool, huh? So they're all kind of related, but a little bit different. So that's kind of nice. Nobody had ever seen these until this morning. So let's do it. So let's go to Kokalk and, um, and make our own new trajectories. So you can, this is where, so here I picked 51 as the number, and then I picked the direction and now we can go to Kokalk and uh, pick our own directions. Samuel is going to share his screen and start talking probably. Good. Great. Hello. Hello. So here we go. This is CoCalc, and so CoCalc stands for Collaborative Calculation. It's an online platform where you can compute and share some files and edit them jointly. So um, since uh, we want uh, polygons with an odd number of sides, and we decided to play with 1851, so first of all, we took 18 times 2 plus 1, so we get a 37 gone, and here are a few periodic trajectories in the 37 gone. So they're, they can be very different. So one of them stays mostly on the outside, the other one more on the inside and less on the outside, but a bit everywhere. This one is a lot less dense. Um, and here's a different one. Um, um, and you notice they all have 37 fold rotational symmetry, uh, except this one maybe, this one has one fold rotational symmetry, which means no rotational symmetry, right? And 37 is a prime. So the only orders of rotational symmetry you could have is either one or 37. But 51 is a bit more interesting because it's 17 times three. So, uh, here's a 51 gone. Can everybody see it? Yeah. So, and we've numbered the sides. Uh, this side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. So every time an odd side and the following even side are aligned horizontally. So we could, if we pick the trajectory that starts from the midpoint of one, to the midpoint of two, then it just goes one side across. So the next bump will bring it again to the next side and so on. And then it's going to do 51 bounces at the midpoint of each consecutive side and then come back to where we started. So where do you think we should start if we want to see 17 fold symmetry? So how many sides should we go so that it's going to take 17 bounces to, to finish up. I got three. Yeah, so we should skip three. So if we start here from the side, which is labeled three here and go to four, so we are skipping one and two. So three over to over one, two and four. So that's three sides across. And this is not the one, so let's, Someone suggested we do the three, four trajectory. 
And there we go. So we started from three over to four, and then two, 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 17 bounces back to side three. Okay. Um, what if we started from five over to six? So this one would go five across. And then that's co prime with 51. So it would do 51 bounces doing several rounds, like probably five rounds across the surface. Um, what about if we wanted a threefold symmetry? Where should we start? Plenty of answers. Everybody says, oh, why not say 15? Okay, so let's do 15. 15, 16. And this one has also got a 17 fold symmetry, right? Because where is it? So it's starting here from uh, side from can you see the, the cursor on my screen? Yes. Um, yes. So this is side 15, the midpoint of side 15, and it goes horizontally to side 16. And because the number of sides it went along is, is a multiple of three, then it's, but not a multiple of 17, then it's going 17 times bouncing back to the start. Right, so what about if we want threefold symmetry? We'd better start from 17, maybe. So let's try 17, 17 to 18. So instead of 15, we go to 17, which is just below here, and let it bounce. And it bounces over skipping 17 sides. So the next time it skips 17 sides again and again, 17 sides. So it's back at the start, right? And now we can uh, start applying all the transformations, which if you remember on the Diana's slides, there was the blue, uh, green, yellow, and pink zones. Uh, and so it was because we were in the, in the five guns, so there were four, uh, different transformations we could apply here. There are 50, so we can uh, apply some of them in sequence, like say the first one followed by the fifth one. And then the trajectory gets a little more complicated, but it still uh, doesn't gain any symmetry. It can only lose some symmetries, never gain. So we started here with something which had threefold symmetry, and we still have threefold symmetry after doing this, right? If we started instead from the one that had 17 fold symmetry, like uh, 15, 16, and we apply again this one and five, uh, the first, the transformation number one and number five, then we again, uh, get 17 fold symmetry, but some more involved transformation, right? So now people can send over in the chat any favorite numbers and we can try to combine them in some way, either by making these half the number of sides or the number of sides or the word, like the number, the numbers of the transformations that we apply in sequence and get some new things that haven't seen haven't been seen before. So while I'm waiting for numbers in the chat, I'll scroll over to some examples. Uh, so this was again in the uh, 51 uh, gone, the regular polygon with 51 sides. And we started with the 17 uh, thing, which would, had order three symmetry and then applied the transformations number five and number seven. And so we got this kind of long trajectory bouncing plenty of times, but still having threefold symmetry inside the 51 gone. I think it's pretty nice. 
I'd love to see a three, five, or seven-fold rotation on the symmetric trajectory on the 105 gone compared with a similar slope trajectory on the 107 gone. All right, let's try that. So the 105 gone is a uh, genus, uh, let's see. So it's the, the genus is uh, half of 105, so it's 52. 52 times two is 104 plus one is 105. And then we take, uh, we start with some initial trajectory uh, one, two, and then we do draw and gone billiard orbit of the word. So that's, uh oh, we want to do this and this. So this one was going to the next side, so you can't really distinguish the trajectory from the outer edge of, but what if we started from 11 to 12, then we would see something a little more visible, maybe. Also, I should make it bigger. Um, fig size 12 or something. And so we said we wanted um, something with three, five or seven fold rotational symmetry. So if we wanted three fold, uh, like, Threefold symmetry, we'd better have it 35 across. Okay, so 35 to 36. Still in the 105 gone, bam, that's the thing. And then if we try to apply some of the, uh, some of the moves to complicate the trajectory a little, so let's do, I don't know, three and four. And then this is still threefold symmetry, right? And now let's do it on the 107 gone to see what it looks like. So we go to 50, genus 53. We also start from side number 35 and then complicate it with the transformations number three and number four and see what we get. I hope this can be computed. Let's see how long it takes. General, are you quite sure that one that we can see has threefold symmetry? It looks sort of oh, not maybe it has just one fold symmetry. Yeah, maybe it started out with threefold symmetry mm -hmm. and then it lost it when we applied these two transformations. You are quite right. So. Yes. All right, we haven't computed 107 gone before. So we don't know how long it takes. So Maybe there are two possibilities. Either it will take too long and we will not see it because we will give up in the middle, or we will all see something that has never been seen before in the history of humanity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a new question in the chat. Let T be a shear and M be the uniform measure on a periodic trajectory, what can you say about the limit T star to the power N of M as N goes to infinity? Does that mean our trajectory is equidistributed? So yeah. you... Yeah, they might not be. So uh, I think Ian's question is like, are the trajectories equidistributed? Like, do they fill in evenly on the square? They do. Um, 
But for example, uh, the, these ones that I have now famously put on these shirts um, and the families that I showed um, show that they don't have to equidistribute uh, with the, you know, whatever measure you would pick. So you can see that these ones are more dense in the middle and then there's this less dense circle. And that's kind of what was interesting about these families that um, they, they don't equidistribute. You can get very, very long ones that are dense in certain areas and not dense in other areas, less dense. And even they're empty I areas. I don't know about this one. It might take too long. Yes. So we can ask for maybe another another favorite numbers from. Yes. So maybe instead of three and four, let's do just one. To complicate it a lot less. And we can get yeah more people numbers if you want. Oh, what happened? Something went completely wrong. Whoa. Oh, right. Um, Cause we changed genus and went to is that the classical thing that happens. Um, so sometimes you remember we got problems when you changed genus and kept working with some pre field thing uh oh yes so thank you everyone you helped us discover <laughs> that there's still a bug in our program. So this is not supposed to look like that. It's supposed to be very roundish. Uh, or maybe it's because I, I stopped it in the middle of a computation. So let me restart the whole worksheet. Restart. So maybe maybe we should take one more, uh, one more favorite number from someone. Either you yes. can say it verbally or you can put it in the chat, some favorite numbers. Yes, someone writes in the comment that Oh, you did that Kurt McMillan thought yeah. about this measure problem. No favorite numbers? Well, we can do today's date or some 1851 business just to see something. But this okay, paper... today is the 21st of April. So let's do a 21 gone maybe. Yeah, that's, that's not working. So let's do a 10, genus 10. So we will get a 21 gone. And then we start from some trajectory over there. Maybe the one that goes 9, 10, uh, 21. Yeah, so that's going to be threefold symmetric. And then today is the fourth of, it's the fourth month. So here's a, something, or we could say this is 2020. So let's do that. And let's start with the one that goes three, four, because it has four from April. Um, and it's seven fold symmetry. Wow. That's beautiful. And nobody has ever seen it before this moment. So Thank you. Okay. So thank you everyone for coming. It's wonderful to see you and I'm so glad that you all showed up. Um, and I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to give this talk. So thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Diana and Samuel.